back in the day, there's an interesting cartoon. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, Ray Kurzweil put it in his one of his books where there's a man on a table and he's writing down all the things that computers will never be able to do. So they'll never be able to make a symphony. And then he has to scratch that out. They'll never be able to uh, draw a painting and he has to scratch that out while well, they're doing that now and he never has to uh, be able to write a novel scratch that out and so and and in your book correct me if I'm wrong I feel like one of the things you're saying is but the two things that we're kind of holding out on you don't say this so much but consciousness and wisdom that's what you know at least the robots and the AIs can't steal that from us we've got that in the bag do you feel, did I misread you? Uh, do you think that wisdom is going to be unattainable for AI or is it, do we just have another five, 10 more years to go or something like that? Look, I think anything that we can do, machines can eventually do. And, and, and the reason I say the brain is an existence proof that it can be done as long as you believe as I do that everything the brain does is contained within our skull. If an AI is smart enough and if it's conscious, the reality is it's also smart enough to know it should deceive us and not tell us that unless right. it it's an advantage to its survival. Um, so we may, and if, even if it does tell us it's conscious, if chat GPT told us today that it's conscious, we would have no reason to believe it. Um, so, or to, or do we have a reason to disbelieve it? I mean, in other words, how would we know? Exactly. We wouldn't know. <laughs> Either way. Right. 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 <laughs> um, so, and, uh, so that so you're suggesting that, consciousness that whole debate is not moot but it's just like it's something that's either unknowable and perhaps even irrelevant in the grand scheme of things or is that right. I, I, I would say that's not where the focus should be okay um, if we assume that chat GP is GPT isn't conscious now it's doing a whole bunch of things that we don't know any other animal species can do mm -hmm. um, <laughs> other than humans and it's doing so, we think, in a way that's not conscious or that it doesn't even necessarily understand, in the way we use the term, what it's doing. Um, and so, it, you know, you can get incredible acts of, of, uh, of intelligence from a machine, and it may not have anything to do with whether it's conscious or not. I think that is a red herring in the, in the conversation. I mean, well, fair that's, enough. Where, that's that's where Hollywood is kind of taken over. Right. But um, yeah, I don't think it really matters. I agree with you completely, Tim. Um, now let's talk about the subject of your book, Wisdom Factories, which is kind of an allusion to schools and the schooling system, which is what you delve in quite a bit in your book. And wisdom is something that you imply. But again, maybe I'm misreading you. That is something that human beings can do so far or certainly better than uh, AI. Do you think that that, what do you think that lead is? And, and do you think it could be a point where AI becomes just as wise and maybe even wiser than human beings? Oh, absolutely. Look, I mean, it, it, the raw materials that AI can chew on are just simply orders of magnitude more than any individual human being can chew on. Right. And we could already say, and really one of the, the big concern that I have that caused me to write the book is, you know, it's easy for us to look at current AI or even the near future AI and say, well, we can still do a bunch that it can't do. Um, but the reality is it can do a bunch that most of us can't do. It already knows way more than I do, even though I know it's wrong sometimes. So am I. Mm -hmm. um, you know, its collective abilities are greater than any human being on the planet, any individual human being. Correct. Right. And so and most of us really can't do these things that it's doing very well, unfortunately. Right. I could I managed hundreds of really smart minds throughout my life. ChatGPT writes better than most of them. Right. So you so schools have known this for a really long time and. And, you know, they list what are usually called 21st century skills, some of which I just mentioned, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, creativity, things of that sort. I think the main point of my book isn't that, gee, humans can do these things and machines maybe can't so well right now. 
that's a lot of people are echoing those terms in various language. They're saying the same thing and have for a long time. What I'm saying is nothing about our existing school model is appropriate if those are the primary goals, right? It, it's, it's right now what I see in education is let's do little tweaks. Um, in particular, I think there's a lot of great work going on on how teachers and students can use AI in the classroom. Did you see the TED Talk by uh, Mr. K the Khan Academy guy recently? It's like well, I saw year. a reference to it, but I haven't watched it. Okay. Anyway, uh, it's fascinating because Khan Academy, for those who don't know, is a wonderful uh, web free website that allows you to learn a lot of stuff that high school and colleges teach you, and they do it in a very friendly way. And he is incorporating into the Khan Academy AI so that it becomes a tutor. And that to me is a really powerful use of it so that instead of just giving you the answer, it kind of coaxes you to like, you know, maybe helps you tighten up that sentence or maybe uh, instead of just telling you the mathematical answer to some derivative, it says, okay, you did, what, is, what's, where are you stuck on? And then it kind of walks you through, okay, here's the next step. Now, can you, do you know what to do after that? And what, what do you think? Do you think that that would be an appropriate use of AI? Oh, absolutely. And not just in education. I think that, um, you know, for years I was doing medical oriented research for the military and the military would talk a lot about how do we find out about, you know, the health conditions and health states when they're not in front of a, a medical provider. Right. It's a huge amount of time that humans aren't available and we would we would like that time to also be rich with, you know, whatever we want to happen. So in medicine, I'd like to be able to improve the health state of people and know about that health state when they're not in the, in, in the doctor's office. Similarly with education, the teacher's only available a certain amount of time. The rest of the time, the student's largely on their own. Mm -hmm. And so having, even if it's a, a poor facsimile, having a, a, a somewhat intelligent tutor that can help students when humans are not available is a perfectly appropriate role for it to play. And, um, uh, you know, I think that's in general, personal assistants are going to be where we see there's going to be much more of the AI that's kind of generically everybody uses the same chat GPT right now. Um, it's going to be much more customized. Lawyers are going to have their own. Doctors are going to have their own with much more authenticated and verified information. Teachers will have their own and students with a whole bunch of different safety protocols built in that aren't there for the chat GPT to the masses. And so that kind of customization is what's coming. And eventually, I believe it's going to be a single, you're going to be dealing with a single personal assistant for you and your needs would be the educational, psychological, or, 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 or just as a, a knowledge recall device. Um, that's customized to how you work. Uh, by the way, for those who are curious, the, it's called Kamingo. Kamingo from the Khan Academy. Kamingo is their AI assistant, and it's twenty dollars a month. Uh, you basically do a donation for twenty dollars a month to have access to that uh, facility. But it's, I agree with you. It's interesting that about 10, 20 years ago, there was a big movement about having virtual assistants or VAs. And everybody wanted to have, you know, my guy in India, who basically is their assistant for $10 an hour that can do all the, the grunt work that you don't want to deal with. And a lot of people were promoting that. I remember Tim Ferriss talked a lot about uh, having a VA. And now you're basically saying is that, well, with AI, we can all have a VA for a, a tiny fraction of the, the cost of, of even the Indian VA. Um, and so I think overall, do you think that that is something that will be a net positive? Because I suppose there's nobody in the world who says AI is 100% going to be just wonderful things and zero bad. And, and the reverse, nobody is on that fence. Most people say, OK, AI is going to bring some blessings and some curses. It's going to be some good things and bad things. Um, do you think where do you sit on the fence, though? Are you 60, 40, 70, 30? How, how do you look at the? How do you analyze it? Uh, GPT-4, as an example, has, I, I don't think there's been an official number put out, but it has many more connections than there are neurons in the brain. 
Hmm. And, and probably it, on the same order as the number of, it, these systems are as big as our brains. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think we have to come to the reality that at just as we're complicated and have all kinds of behaviors that don't necessarily serve society or even us very well at times, so too will AI. Um, and so it reminds me, by the way, sorry to interrupt, but uh, Yuval Harari, the um, Israeli uh, philosopher, uh, historian, um, he was saying that we sh AI should not be artificial intelligence. It should stand for alien intelligence because they literally it will think differently than we do. It has its own issues. It has its own hallucinations that we may never have. But uh, anyway, it's fascinating. It kind of reminded me when you were saying that. Continue, please. No, so your general question is, uh, where am I in, yeah. in in the harm versus good? I think in the near term, far more harm is possible than good. Hmm. And, and, and that's for two reasons. One is that as individuals, we won't be as learned and sophisticated about how to use these tools appropriately and when they're good and when they're not. And we may place too much credence in, you know, there's some indication that when AI puts out an answer, people consider it more authoritative than when, than when another human does. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's not necessarily a good thing, right? You have mm -hmm. to have that, that, that critical view toward whatever you're consuming. And right now, a lot of our society does not have a critical view toward what they consume. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a big concern that this that could make the problem much, much worse. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's exacerbated by the fact that people are going to be intentionally serving up misinformation at times. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in the short term, there's more danger than not. That also has to do with the fact that we're not regulating in ways that I think there are very simple steps to take. Even if we debate how they can be done, we should understand when we're talking to an AI and not a person. Right. I want that to be a law, even though I don't know how we can enforce that entirely. It still sets up a set of norms that are important for the broader community. Um, and there are various ways that AI should be tested and developed. Um, you almost need a FDA kind of blessing to get it out, in my view. Right. And our, our institutions are slow. And so by the time they get around to dealing with this, by the time they actually start asking about the dangers of social media, you know, it's already happened. So I think in the near term, there really is potentially more danger than good. But that's because us and our institutions are going to be slower to evolve than the technology. It kind of reminds me a little bit about cryptocurrency in the sense that cryptocurrency moves at a breakneck speed and the SEC and the other governing agencies just cannot keep up. You know, before you know it, they invent new currencies, they invent uh, new ways of trading, and and it's, they're always like five years ahead of whatever the SEC is trying to keep up with. So it's very hard uh, to do so, and AI is, is in the same bucket. Your book, uh, Wisdom Factories, talks a lot about education and how to either reform, improve the educational system. Now, I'm curious, let's say, for people who are in fields that require a lot of memorization. For example, medicine, where you have to know all the bones in the body, you need to know how the endocrine system works, etc. Uh, a lot of that stuff will seem so quaint, just like asking in 1930s somebody to do long division. They didn't have a calculator, and so they had to do long division by hand. And eventually they got over that and like, okay, we have spreadsheets, we have calculators. And, and so now you don't have to learn to do all that stuff by hand. And so I'm, I'm wondering, will we get to a point where, let's say, doctors and PAs and, and nurses may not have to learn all that information? And because in the end, if you want to know how the hypothalamus works or, you know, what this particular uh, vaccine does and what does it uh, modulate, you can just ask your AI assistant, which is right there. Um, and so could that change the way that medicine, for example, is taught in medical school where currently memorization is paramount to passing and, and becoming a doctor? But in the future, if you've got an AI basically in your head or on your phone, will, that, will other skills, let's say soft skills, let's say like uh, interfacing with the, with the customer and the customer, the, the, the patient, um, is going to be maybe more important, more valued than whether you remember how many neurons there are in the head. Uh, so the answer is yes, eventually, but obviously we have a regulatory process for medicine 
that's going to mean that products for those types of fields um, where there's great risk of personal harm if the AI is wrong are going to be going through rigorous testing processes. And, and so those will come out more slowly. But your general question about how much knowledge do we still need and of what sort? The clo- in our head. In our in head. In our right. head. Correct. Right. In our head. That's very much an open research question. Um, the research on whether knowledge is needed. So the general par- the rule of education is you can't learn a new a new something until you understand the knowledge underlying that new something. And there's right. a lot of effort in education to draw up, um, you know, these, these various maps that say, I got to learn this and this and this and this. Um, I would say that premise isn't supported by research. Um, there's a lot of con- conflicting evidence as to whether prior knowledge is needed for a lot of tasks. Increasingly, the kind of knowledge we need isn't facts like you described, all the bones in the body and da da da. But you know, increasingly, a, a physician will have to understand the way the body works as a system, right? You know, I, I once got asked to go on a medicine uh, that, that a doctor would had des- described that I might benefit my long term health. And my basic question to him was, how does it work? Um, you know, where in the what mechanism in the body? Because I had a lot of medical training or at least physiological training. You know, how does that work? He couldn't answer me the question. He knew all the facts about the dosage and the name of the drug and what it did and what it was in disease states it was intended to improve, but he couldn't tell me how it worked. And as a customer, I then did said, well, he doesn't really understand that, right? He doesn't understand the body as a system. And so in a general sense, we're moving from having to know the basic facts and uh, around a situation to having to understand how basic facts relate to one another and, and, um, contribute to the overall system that we're trying to perturb. I'm using system very generically. It could be our body. It could be, you know, a legal case. It could be, you know, your insurance application, but there's a, there's some system that this, that we're trying to perturb with some, some either mental analysis or, or, or uh, machine analysis. And increasingly that's getting more and more abstract and more and more at the system level of knowledge that we need to know. Okay. Mm-hmm. So if you look at, for example, um, there was a researcher named Phil Tetlock who did decades of research on whether geopolitical experts could really predict things very well. The talking heads on TV, or they could they really predict accurately, right? Well, it turns out that most experts actually don't do much better than random or not at, many, not at all. Mm-hmm. But the people who did best were people who had these broad knowledge bases The super forecasters. Yeah. And in particular, they had, um, they had certain humble personalities, right? That, that, you know, what, what, what getting really deep into a field does to really any human being, this is not a pejorative is it makes us believe we know a lot, Mm -hmm. right. As opposed to making us understand that we're, we're ignorant. The Dunning Kruger effect. (laughs) Yes. Yes. So, so that was shown in these kind of experiments. The people did, did great. The knowledge they brought to the game wasn't all of the details behind whatever they were asked to predict. It was a way of understanding how to analyze a problem. It's a process for knowing what information to go and get and what questions to ask. So the key things for a doctor, right, when you have a machine that can serve up details are in helping to understand what are the possibilities in the diagnostic space and what are the ways that I could best get information to help me understand? And really, when you look at what doctors are best at, and this is true of any human where you've had to memorize a ton of stuff, most of what you memorized is gone a few years later. I mean, you just never had a chance to use it, and it didn't stick, right? Now, maybe it can be recalled more effectively when you eventually need to do it, right? But I would say we don't know what is sufficient knowledge for us, right? Because previously we had to keep all the information in our heads. 
we've gone through this period of the last, say, 50 years of computerization where computers were keeping track of a lot of the details, right? Um, and there has been evolution in education toward, you know, there's much more time spent on patient-doctor interaction, on reasoning processes and diagnostics. Um, you know, I'm sure they still memorize a lot, but a lot of, a lot of schooling at the college level is about, you know, these sort of richer, what I would call wisdom oriented skills. Right now, r nearly half of college students are using ChatGPT or some sort of AI in their uh, studying. Do you think we'll get to the point where just like, okay, uh, let's take a step back. Uh, the MCAT, which is the standardized test for medical school and the ASVAB, which is for the military and for, and the GED. And I think the SAT, a lot of them don't allow calculators um mm -hmm. in their tests and i'm just wondering will we but many schools when you're getting tested especially for high level mathematics they absolutely do in fact they tell you and they encourage you to have a graphing calculator uh for your for your math tests and for your calculus tests will do you think that we're going to have classes where they kind of yes we want you to use ai in your tests and we want you to write essays with ai assistance and that kind of stuff or it's certainly permissible just like a calculator in certain situations is permissible in tests and and i and and personally i think it's kind of silly not to allow people to use a calculator in a test because in the real world you get to use a calculator <laughs> you know you can't work for microsoft and they say sorry you can't use a calculator <laughs> they're going to say yeah go ahead it's going to make you more efficient so and and i imagine microsoft is going to encourage you to use ai if that's going to help you be more productive what do you think Look, I think this does depend on the individual learning objective, right? If I'm trying to teach somebody to read, right, or, or write, I don't necessarily want everything to be based on, you know, an AI's writing and a modification of that, because I really want to teach them the skill of reading or writing, hmm. okay? But at other times, and I think this is, a, you know, what, what you're touching on is really, I think, the key point of my book, which is that you're not going to get there by feeding that they're meaning these, you know, teaching people to, to accept and do well at, at these higher level human thinking tasks that work will require. We're not going to get them there by taking the problems, spitting them into a whole bunch of pieces and trying to teach them how to do those individual pieces. Many of which machines can already do, as you point out. Mm -hmm. um, but rather what we have to do is we have to put people in realistic situations or complex, albeit age appropriate uh, problems and challenges are presented that require multiple perspectives, multiple knowledge disciplines that engage a student's curiosity um, and that are different that vary a lot from one time to the next, right? You'll see MBA programs do this you know, this is like the dominant part of how they train people, right? Is they say, okay, we're putting people that come out of an MBA program into, you know, at least eventually leadership roles that have to deal with all of these squishy factors, right? They don't try to get sit up there with PowerPoint charts and teach them how to, how to lead. They put them in case study situations. They have them analyze the companies and what they did right or wrong. They'll have... You know, they'll put them in scenarios and say, let's talk through this. Um, and then there may be relevant research that they dig into that supports or refutes a particular approach to the problem. Right. So that's what I would call a top down approach. Top down, meaning the top is the challenge is, is what matters first and foremost. And then the, and then, of course, you go down and you reach and you grab the knowledge you need to support your ability to address the challenge. We do it the opposite. In, in most places, but certainly K through 12, but also even in most college courses, um, we make sure they get, you know, brick by brick, all the, the knowledge in the field, but we may never show them, here's a problem that needs to be addressed. Here's what the field is struggling with that we don't know how to do yet. And here was what people's various approaches are to that problem. None of what I taught you will help you solve that problem because, but that problem is the kind of one you're going to get in the workplace. Right. So, so if we're, 
teaching people as we are in, let's say, high school, high school math progression, if we're teaching people to spend most of their time solving equations or, or, or the like, or graphing something manually or whatever it might be, um, there's, a, there's a point in the learning progression where that's important, right? I, I played around with manually with very simple models of artificial neural networks, which are the basis of modern AI when I was in graduate school. And I tried to make it do certain things by, by just hand wiring it, right? Nobody does that. Nobody even did that back then. But I was, tr but, you know, I was trying to model the brain at the time, and I really wanted to understand what these individual parts of the network were doing. That taught me a great deal, but it wasn't at all useful in a, in a generic sense when I went to the workforce. Do you still need to give people experiences that are appropriate and that you can't, if you throw huge problems at somebody that are over their head, they're not going to learn. But if you feed them just a bunch of, let's, we'll call it a bunch of trees and you expect them to see the forest from that, that's not going to happen either. People don't solve equations by hand in the workplace. So, you know, it's appropriate to teach them that this is what a computer is doing sort of behind the scenes. But to have them do something that nobody does, I think that's, or I shouldn't say nobody, but a small fraction of the world, um, you know, tries to go and invent a new math theorem or something like that. Um, that, that just doesn't, that has such an opportunity cost compared to all the things we're not teaching. Very true. Well, Tim Dacey, thank you so much. You wrote the book, uh, Wisdom Factories, AI, Games, and the Education of the Modern Worker. It just came out in June of 2023. We're in right now in August of 2023. So it's, uh, it's a fresh book. And uh, I encourage people to go get it on Amazon or you can go to your website, which is timdacey.com. That's D-A-S-E-Y.com to learn more about it and get a link to uh, to, to find out more about you, Tim. Uh, thank you again so much for your time uh, to come on the Water Learn Show. And uh, I appreciate it. Any last parting words of wisdom for people? Since you wrote Wisdom Factory, what are your last words of wisdom? <laughs> no, I mean, I think there's a lot of parents in particular who are wondering about their kids' futures and recent graduates and all of that. And I think the general advice I would give them is have broad interests, have broad curiosity. That's the, like a broad base is really what's going to drive you in into a modern career and serve you well throughout the career. And it will help you learn anything else, any particular specialty much faster. Fabulous. Tim, thank you again for your time. Thanks, Francis.